So my name is Inti Brasil, and I work as an associate professor of the Department of Neuropsychology and Rehabilitation Psychology in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. I'm also a researcher at the Forensic Mental Health Facility in Nijmegen. The work I do is basically tar uh, revolves around trying to translate uh, clinical questions to empirical research. So clinicians uh, struggle with certain uh, uh, issues that they see when they're treating their patients in forensic settings, and we try to answer these questions by conducting empirical research. The topic can be quite broad. Sometimes it's uh, adaptive behavior. We have also studied emotions, uh, social functioning, everything related to something that's relevant to the clinician. My experience with psychopathic offenders is that a part of their, their you know, them being psychopathic is that they're quite charming. Um, and many of them are quite socially skilled, much more than people would expect. I've been doing this work for about 15 years now, uh, working with them, and it's always been, I've never had any incidents. Built kind of, you know, semi-friendships, <laughs> not, not, not true friendships, but you get kind of, no, you, you get to know people, and uh, I've even had these occasions at which, they, you know, some, one of them was, uh, it was his birthday, and he made a cake, and then he, he saved a piece of cake for me, <laughs> and I got cake. <laughs> Of course, I was very suspicious about the ingredients of the cake. <laughs> but I didn't eat it. <laughs> so that's something, that's the other part of it, right? The interactions are nice, but we are always wary, always kind of alert about what may happen and try to read the situation. So you cannot afford to just lean back, even if you're sitting at a desk uh, together and there's a pencil on the desk, I tend to kind of take that away because, you know, it can be used for a weapon. I, I learned to be quite aware of all the dangers around me when you have someone like that around you. Uh, the facility where I work, it's a specialized facility in which the environment is being, being uh, structured in a way that reduces uh, like aggressive outbursts so that you have no, all these incidents. Um, so actually they do quite well when they're inside. Because it's very structured and everything is clear and, and, they, and they don't know if they misbehave, then they have to stay longer in the facility instead of leaving after a few years and all these things. So there, there are consequences to them misbehaving. We call them patients, right? So we don't call them offenders, we call them patients. You approach the patient as if it's a human person. <laughs> Right. So when, when they get to these facilities here, right, so according to the Dutch system, you get people get caught by the police because they commit these crimes. And then uh, if there's any indication that whatever they did had to do with some kind of mental instability, like mental illness, personality disorder, there uh, we have specialized uh, uh, that's not diagnostic facilities that you know that that's all they do. They kind of study and, and try to see if there's a link between the, the, the crimes and mental, some kind of mental issue. Um, and if there is the case, then the offenders are sent to jail for a few years and then they're transferred to these uh, treatment facilities with the idea that they can be rehabilitated. So if you don't do anything because of the, their personality is the same, their mental issues may be the same, they just get worse. They get out and then they reoffend within five years, right? Uh, well, uh, the view here would be that, no, you send them to these specialized treatment facilities to, to rehabilitate them. So you, you, they actually follow therapy. Uh, and it's mandatory, right? So the judge says they, should, they have to go to, to such facilities. Um, and that's one aspect that I think that's quite different in, in some of the countries I've seen, that it's not just a number, it, it's actually a person. If you can help the person be, become a better version of him or herself, then uh, when this person gets out, you, you actually reduce the chance of reoffending. So you protect society. When it comes to psychopathic offenders specifically, it's, it's still quite challenging to help them even within the system, right? So you see the other offenders that come in with other types of personality disorders. Um, um, and I mean, it, the system works quite well. So you see after, you know, they get out, they get through the system after many years, they get out, they go and live on their life. Some of them, you never hear them again. So a smaller proportion will, will, will recidivate, but it's still a lower portion than uh, if you would have sent them to jail, regular jail. When it comes to the psychopathic offenders, they still remain, uh, a, 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 it's still a challenge to treat them. So you, you can achieve a little bit, but it's not, they respond relatively uh, less, to, less, less to, to current treatment, basically. So you do see the same problem, but in a different setting, in a different variation, in a sense.
based on, on my experience with these guys, is what you what you can clearly see is that the, the psychopathic offenders tend to be uh, more socially skilled, at least the one that ends up, they, they end up in my lab in the, in the system, I see. Uh, more socially skilled, uh, very friendly, while you see the, the, the non-psychopathic offenders tend to be more aggressive, more volatile, more irritable as well. Um, but uh, on the other hand, being irritable and, and violent, it, it, it's straightforward, so it's easy to read. You know what to expect from these non-psychopathic offenders. While with psychopathic guys, you ha always have to be uh, kind of you know, on your toes because they can be very nice and offer you cake, but you don't know whether the cake is poisoned or not. <laughs> um, so there's always this extra layer of doubt about the intentions and they're more difficult to read. So they live on, on wards with I don't know, 10 to 15 or so. Um, and the, the ones that tend to dominate the culture on the war in terms of the social structure, it tend to, they tend to be the psychopathic guys. So, so there's this, this, this dominance uh, that they impose on others that you don't see in the non-psychopathic guys. And they kind of set the hierarchy and move people around, deal with them a little bit, right? try to, to set up uh, arguments among you know, different uh, inmates or patients in our case uh, to achieve personal goals. Right? So there's always this, this drive to kind of gain something for themselves either and it's not always monetary like status right so they want respect and they want to be feared by others and and being being socially dominant um that's something that uh, in my experience has been like one of the the most salient differences between psychopathic and non-psychopathic offenders it's not per se a myth uh, but it's more like a, a, something that should be we should be more conscientious about, I guess, is that the fact that the claim that all psychopaths are fearless. So that we say they cannot learn because they don't fear the consequences or that uh, they do all these crazy things because they are fearless. They do experience fear. So people, by, by, by saying that they are fearless, people like the general audience, the general public, they assume that there's like zero fear, like there's no emotion there whatsoever. Well, that's not the case, it's, a, it's relative. You know, compared to the other people who are like normally functioning individuals on their, uh, in terms of fear and all their emotions, they tend to seem as if they, they fear consequences of their actions less than others. So it's a relative statement, it's not an absolute statement, what people often believe is an absolute statement. So we have done some research that in which we say, okay, fear is not, is not like one big lump of emotion, right? It's not one thing. We also know from the way that the brain works and also from animal research that uh, fear has like multiple components. You can make a distinction between uh, people who respond, how we respond to threatening uh, events uh, versus the actual experience of the emotion of fear. I found evidence in the literature on psychopathy uh, indicating that it, they do seem to have an impairment in how they respond to threats, to threatening events. And you can measure it in the body, you can measure it in the brain. They don't see danger. It's really like that. It doesn't mean that they don't fear the danger less. We didn't find like very robust evidence saying that they don't feel the emotion of fear. That's not to say that it may not be the case that they still experience it less. It's just that it's less absolute and, and uh, carved in stone as uh, many have been, have been kind of start to believe at some point.